Hi, I'm Dylan Richards. In New York, we have the United Nations and the best food from all over the world. Follow me as I search for the healthiest food in the five boroughs on Dylan's Lunchbox. More crunch. Very soon. Pop it out here with the oranges going to start to come out of it. Flagship cheese. Here's your burger. Fly the opposite way. I'm Tanya Sokova for Dylan's Lunchbox. How you got into organic farming? About American cuisine. Who doesn't love Italian food? Chinese food is one of the oldest cuisines in the world. We're here to find out what's in your lunchbox. We all know eating healthy is important, but did you know that locavorism is not only a great way to find fresh, organic ingredients, but that it also helps the environment and local business. This episode of Dylan's Lunchbox is all about staying close to home. I'm going to check out the popular Union Square Farmer's Market, talk to some local growers and farmers, and drop by Green Square Tavern where Chef John Marsh is going to show me some great local dishes. So grab your reusable grocery bags and let's hit the market. We're at Union Square Market, so what are we gonna do today? We're gonna buy a bunch of food that we'll use at the restaurant over the next three days. How many times do you come to the market? Every day they're open. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. So why is it so important to eat locally? I know my suppliers. I look them in the eye every time I make a purchase. I talk to them about how the crop is going, and I can get there in an hour and a half. All right, I really want to visit their site, and I do. I always visit. We're going to make some uh, bread pudding and okay. some applesauce. We'll start with apples. They're extremely versatile. Then we're going to pick up mutsus for um, a bread pudding. OK. And we may get some gallus for applesauce. It's a gallus. This one's better for my favorite for sauce. Is it sweeter Make a fresh and sour? Apple sauce. It's a it's a very naturally sweet apple without being overwhelming. And the sauce we make is nothing but a little um, Ronnie Brook butter, salt, pepper, and these apples. Uh, most of the sweetness comes from the skin. When picking tomatoes, what do you look for? Now, even though that's going to be so slightly softer, mm -hmm. what we're going to do is cut it and roast it. Yeah, so, so it doesn't matter. I'm only hopeful of the flavor remaining, and it should. All right, three. Okay. Okay, you're going to have to sit now or hop out. Which is it going to be? It's always great stuff. Their people are great. They're helpful. And they know what they want. You all right there, Meats? A lot of vegetables, yeah. especially root vegetables, the harder, the better. The character, and the texture, and the flavor are all really at their peak. How do you choose the right ones? Size, basic appearance, just like a pretty girl or a handsome guy. The, best, the better looking and the harder they are, the better they'll eat. I don't. I serve them raw. I shred. I I shred them. Wow. Black radish. It's not on the list, but it's too good to pass up. Why is it so good? How will you prepare what? them? I'm gonna shred it. Shred it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Serve it raw, almost like, like a slaw. Salad, like a yes. Slaw? Yes, like ma'am. It's gonna be part of a, a a salad I make with quinoa. What's the difference between the purple one and the green one? I like the purple because it just has a more of a radish feel in my mouth. And the other is milder. The green one is milder. Ever so slightly, yeah. but only by a, a small measure. You can always make some friends at the market. Fennel is something that I'll use in a variety of different dishes. Whether I need it or not, when it looks this good, we're all over it. Now what you're going to look for is plumpness. You'll feel some moisture in it, but again, firm and sort of fresh looking. Beauty. Huge one. You need a bag for that? We're all together. 
No. Well, yeah, you know what? I will take it back. This food is all grown in its own most natural state. These all have the nutrition that comes from the earth. All the microorganisms that live in the soils are essential to have this carry all the nutrients that um, it had 200 years ago. Hello, Chef. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Fine, thank you. The expense of eating well, it's minor compared to the disadvantages of poor health. Yeah, look at you. You're the healthiest kid I've seen in 20 years. Because <laughs> you eat right. Thank you for the card. All righty, good to see you again. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. You will find it difficult to locate another single food source with as much naturally occurring health promoting properties as broccoli. A single cup of steamed broccoli provides more than 200% of the RDA for vitamin C, nearly as much of vitamin K, and about half of the daily allowance for vitamin A, along with plentiful folate, fiber, sulfur, iron, B vitamins, and a whole host of other important nutrients. Calorie for calorie, broccoli contains about twice the amount of protein as steak and a lot more protective phytonutrients. Broccoli's phytochemicals fight cancer by neutralizing carcinogens and accelerating their elimination from the body. Phytonutrients called indoles found in broccoli help protect against prostate, gastric, skin, breast, and cervical cancers. Extensive studies have linked broccoli to a 20% reduction in heart disease risk. In Chinese medicine, broccoli is used to treat eye inflammation. How much? If you could eat a little broccoli every day, your body will thank you for it. If you can't swing it, aim for eating it as much as you can possibly do. Like many other vegetables, broccoli provides fantastic nutrition both in its raw form and when it's properly cooked. Cooking reduces some of broccoli's anti-cancer components, but lightly steaming it will preserve most of the nutrients. Broccoli is available fresh year-round in most areas, but if you can't find it where you live, frozen broccoli is a good substitute. Celebrity yoga instructor Gwen Lawrence is back in Central Park with us. So I hear we're doing the frog today? Yes, we're doing frog. And frog is a great one to hold for a long time. So however much you have, you're going to give to this one for sure. You're going to come onto your hands and knees. Right. What's important about this one is that your hips are right in line with your knee joint so that you're not really far back and you're not forward. And then come as far apart as you can with that same positioning and then onto your forearms. Open your feet apart a little bit more. That's it and you can make two gentle fists. So this one, I'm gonna suggest you hold for one to five minutes. First time I ever did this pose, I held it for 20 minutes and I saw my life flash before my eyes. It was very difficult. But this is obviously gonna open groin, inner thigh, which gets very tight and held during long days in school, long days on the field of play, whatever it is. So this, this will help open up the hips. And whenever the hips are more open and supple, it reduces the stress and strain on the knee, which is very vulnerable. So it's really important. And then coming out of it is a little dicey, not very graceful, but do the best you can. Just walk yourself forward out of it, maybe onto your stomach and take a little break. Good. A couple times a week, definitely. You're gonna see a difference in your hip flexibility. So what okay. yoga move are we doing? We're gonna today? do pigeon pose. Ooh. Yes. I think one of one of the perennial favorites for a lot of people. You're gonna pick a leg, any right. leg, whatever leg you want. You're gonna bring it forward and slide the opposite leg back. So what's important here is that your hips stay nice and square and center, that you're not sitting on your right hip. And if you can, you're gonna go down to your forearms. And I think you can go all the way out onto your belly. We want to hold this one to three minutes. This is a very deep glute stretch, so it's going to help you when you're running on the field. It's going to help anybody that has tension or stress from sitting long days, 
at your desk or being still and doing your job all day long. It's a real good tension reliever. It's important not to hold your belly tight when you're here and to kind of release your jaw too. Come upright nice and tall. Slowly bend that back leg, you're good at this one. Reach around, grab the foot and let that foot come nice and close to your hip. So we're gonna increase the flexibility of the opposite quad. So we balance out I the really stretch in the it. leg. That's yeah. a great one. And then you're gonna let it go nice and slow. And don't forget, since this is a one-sided one, that you always want to do the other side. Opening up the hips really reduces a lot of stress and tension and anxiety. So enjoy this one. <laughs> hey, Lunchboxers. Did you know you can grow your own local produce in your home? Finding the space to grow your own vegetables can be pretty challenging. But it's easy to grow plants like lettuce and basil. They can grow in small pots near any windowsill. Just make sure it receives six to eight hours of sunlight. For those New Yorkers with cramped apartments, check out wall hanging canvas pockets that allow you to grow plants on your wall. And if you're in a giving mood, check out the academic gardens at United States of Food. You can donate a classroom garden through Bird's Nest Foundation, and it will go to a school where children will be able to learn about growing and healthy eating. Find out the right solution for you and eat your way to a healthier life. I'm about to meet with Phil, who's an organic farmer. He's going to be telling me his views on growing and eating organic produce. So Phil, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into organic farming? I was in the sport marketing business for 25 years. Wow. And uh, loved that. Uh, traveled a lot, met a lot of interesting people. And then 9-11 happened. And I said, I want to do something that's going to make a difference in the world. People always have to eat. I think I want to farm. And uh, we felt that the organic was the right way to go because the farming that we've done in this country for the past 50 years is unsustainable. We started farming in 2007 and we became certified organic in 2009. So why is it important for your farm to be certified organic? We thought that uh, with the organic seal, the USDA seal, yep. that would give us credibility in the market that we are doing it all the right way. Uh, there's a third party endorser that says we're doing it the right way. Yep. And we have all the backup material that says we're doing it the right way. So just out of curiosity, Dylan, how much do you think of this nation's produce comes from California, for example? Maybe 10, 20 percent? It's 50 percent wow. of our produce comes from California. They have 8 million acres of irrigated land in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and that's where our fruit and produce comes from. And now um, California is in the middle of their fourth year of drought. There's a uh, aquifer called the Ogallala Aquifer. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay, so the Ogallala Aquifer is a huge underground water reservoir okay. that 100 years ago was a lake the size of Lake Superior. And they've taken so much water out of it to irrigate land out in that part of the country that, that it's no longer a lake, it's now a sponge. Whoa. The gas is not getting any cheaper. Yep. Diesel is $4 a gallon now. Probably in a couple of years, it'll be five or six or seven dollars a gallon. So all those elements that used to make uh, bringing in produce cheap from California will go away. And so where are we going to get our food from in this part of the country? From farms like mine in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. Why is it important for this food revolution to continue? I think this food revolution um, uh, will help farmers in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York a, stay in business um, and give us more diversity um, because that is another issue that our farms in the Midwest and, and out West, they're not as diversified. Right. They grow monocultures. Nature doesn't like monocultures um, and a monoculture is, you know, where only one thing is grown. For example, there are some farms in Iowa that they grow a thousand acres of corn. Right. And um, God forbid if there was ever some disease that, that came into that corn, and ravage that corn, that farm could be out of business. We have a diversified farm. Mm -hmm. you know, we have chickens, we have pasture-raised beef, we have produce. So diversification is important, 
and I think that um, the food revolution will continue because that's what people want to continue to buy. And no matter where you're from, no matter what language you speak, when you sit down for a meal with somebody, you get to know somebody better, right? And, and we're all connected that way. Yep. And, and I think that's philosophically, I think, what the slow food movement is all about. So I'm all over that. I'm, it's perfect. If we can make one person, one individual, change their lifestyle a bit or decide that they're going to modify their diet somewhat and then they go out and they tell two people and then those people tell two people then you begin to get some sort of economies of scale and you get lots of people beginning to sort of um, approach their food in a different way and we've just developed a relationship with a, a school called uh, wellness at spruce and their whole mission is uh, is part of the whole slow food uh, local food movement and uh, their curriculum is all about uh, having uh, students learn more about where their food comes from so that's how you make a difference you know it's, it's just eating better exercising and mostly um, education and just being aware of it right you know being aware of, of what food and putting into your system what that does to you and how you can be better if you approach what you eat better. Have you received any backlash from going organic? Uh, no, well, you know what, interestingly, some of the people who are conventional have been farming that way for their entire lives. Right. Um, there's been a little bit of pushback from individuals like that, but that's mostly of just the unknown, right? People have a fear of the unknown, and it's interesting that if they really thought about it, uh, my great-grandfather was a farmer, and I suspect, although it wasn't called organic back in those days, that he farmed organically. Because mm -hmm. they didn't have artificial fertilizers and artificial chemicals back then. But lots of people have jumped on board. They, they like it. Um, they know that it's better for the environment. They know it's the right way to go. And frankly, the earth needs it. So, you know, I'm just trying to do my little piece. And if there's another hundred guys like me doing the same thing, then perhaps all of us collectively, we can make a difference. Fruit is always a great and healthy dessert choice. Naturally sweet, full of vitamins or important nutrients and requiring basically no preparation, you can't go wrong with a banana, grapes, an orange, or any number of other options provided by nature. When shopping for fruit, keep an eye out for ones that are organically grown or free of pesticides. Also, learn what's in season and how to spot the perfect ripeness and you'll end up with fresh, delicious fruit every time. Sari Saffa reporting live on the streets of New York during lunch hour. We're here to find out what's in your lunchbox. So what did you order for lunch today? I ordered myself a fancy steak taco. Why'd you make that choice? Because it was there, it called to me, it spoke to me, I passed it earlier, I came back to get one. Sounds good. Do you... I got to get a suntan at the same time, it's a beautiful day. So what did you eat for lunch today? This is a fruit and a vegetable shake. Do you know what's in it? I do. It's carrot, ginger and apple. Why'd you choose to eat that for lunch? Because it's healthy. It's light, it's healthy, and it's refreshing. Did you get anything else today to eat? Nope, just this for lunch. And do you ever bring anything from home? I do, I do bring home, I do. When and why do you choose to do that? Um, I usually do that on days I know I'm gonna be really busy, and I might not be able to get out of the office. And do you ever bring lunch from home? Uh, occasionally, yeah. Why did you choose to come out today? Uh, I'm working down the block. This is convenient, and I hold this, the trucks around here are really good. When do you choose to eat out? Um, I would say, depending on the week at work, but I would say usually two days I can get out and grab something to eat. Rest of the time it's behind my desk. So there you have it. We found out today what people are eating in the streets of New York. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Watch out. Next we might ask you what's in your lunchbox.
Farmer's markets are great places to find local produce and goods. Unlike most grocery stores, the food from farmer's markets are usually sold directly by the farmers themselves. This means fresher fruit, vegetables, meats, as well as a variety of other crafted products. It also supports the local economy and helps farmers keep growing the food you love. Be sure to check out one of the many neighborhood farmers markets in New York City, including the popular Union Square Farmers Market. Unlike many other restaurants, Green Square Tavern uses local ingredients. Let's go inside and see if the local ingredients make a difference. So what's Green Square Tavern's philosophy? To serve local, sustainable, traceable, foods to as many people as possible for a, a modest price. Part of being a locavore means that you'll change what you eat over the course of the year. And we're very much limited by local supplies. And why is it so important to be local and organic? Food travels a shorter distance. I know all my suppliers. That's the greatest relationship I can have. How do your customers respond to eating healthy? So far, really well. I'm not going to proclaim that all my clientele is enlightened, but hopefully they enjoy the food. They ask why it's different than other foods they've had that are very similar, and we introduce them to the concept. You and I are going to cook, aren't we? We are. Okay. Uh, you'll have your choice of a quinoa salad with an iron grilled sirloin steak and a Lancaster County rotisserie roast chicken. So what do we have here? Our first dish today is a quinoa salad. Now we cook the quinoa like rice right. with very little pure water, some garlic, shallot, onion, and shredded carrot. Rather simple dish. Totally, totally simple and straightforward. The idea of this dish is a variety of flavors and textures and nutritional components taken together to make for an interesting appetizer. So what's next? Next we're going to go in and do some hot dishes. We're going to iron grill a sirloin steak and then we're going to ro finish cooking a rotisserie roast chicken. Great. This guy is grass fed. And that adds so many different health components that I'm happy to serve it and I don't have any worries about contributing to someone's high cholesterol. This is just organic extra virgin olive oil and we use it right. just to hydrate. How long does it take to cook the steak? This will probably take about five minutes. If you don't mind, we cook it medium rare. That's great. Okay. This is kale. It's a very hearty green vegetable, which is high in iodine and other antioxidants. Yep. We use duck fat here for our home fries on the weekend, and this is beef fat where we cook our sweet potato french fries and our regular french fries. Excellent. Very nice. We just toss that, season it very lightly, and finish it in the oven. How long does this whole process generally take with the fries? Depending upon how uh, uh, the customers order the steak, it can be served to them in five minutes. Wow. Physical culturalists will tell you that eating raw food is better than eating very cooked food. So in any case, Something cooked rare will have more vital nutrients, more easily assimilated than something cooked well done. Perfect. And uh, voila. Now we're going to just finish the chicken by crisping the skin. Those herbs, that's our fall mix, which is tarragon, thyme, marjoram, oregano, and chives. So what inspired you to open the restaurant? 
my wife and I have always lived sustainably eating local foods and or organic foods and that's how we're raising our daughter. It would be impossible for me not to do business that way. It certainly smells and looks good, but let's see how it tastes. The taste, the smell, and the textures were spot on. It was everything that I expected it to be. I know I'm gonna be back to Green Square Tavern, and I recommend that you come too. This has been a great episode of Dylan's Lunchbox. We got to see how great food might be closer than you think, and how sticking to local ingredients can inspire some pretty creative and delicious recipes. Don't forget to check out your local farmer's market to learn more about eating local, and check out these great websites for more info. Join us again on the next episode of Dylan's Lunchbox.